fundamentally change not only how you play the game, but why you play the game. So what is crafting? Why does it matter? Why should you be as excited as I am about this? Well, first off, crafting is a profession. It requires its own set of tools, the knowledge of how to use them. Crafting offers progression. You become a better crafter by learning new blueprints and upgrading them. Crafting builds on the existing gathering professions. When you would go out and you collect your materials for crafting, you, we are adding new depth and meaning to those activities. Crafting provides customization. There isn't just one way to craft something. Like I said, we have upgrades. How you make and upgrade the things you craft is sometimes just as important as what you're crafting. In addition, you can earn cosmetic upgrades, craft unique items, even subscriber flair. But nowhere is this versatility more obvious than base building. We're going to have nearly limitless options for how you construct your home, how to customize your base to meet your own goals. Most importantly, crafting gives you new, a lot of new choices. The choices will impact your goals in the game, your interactions with other players, and eventually how you see the game itself. So where do we get started with crafting? Well, you can't craft without materials. <laughs> Luckily, we've got a lot of ways to gather resources in the game. And crafting is designed to complement and expand on all of these existing gathering professions, as well as future additions. Let's take a closer look at mining as an example. We've got hand mining and vehicle mining and ship mining. That's a lot of mining. But with crafting, we're going to introduce a lot of materials. So there's not just more to mine, but we're also going to specialize. So for instance, each type of mining will have its own unique materials to gather. Gathering specific materials efficiently will require you to use the, the right gathering profession. Let's talk about refining. Currently, only mining resources can be refined, but doing so allows you to turn them into more valuable processed resources. With crafting, we're going to expand refining to include options for all raw materials. In addition to expanding the variety of materials you can gather, refining lets you create process materials that you're going to need to craft your upgraded blueprints. So now that you've gathered all these materials, what do you do with them? Currently, your only options in the game really are to like, sell them to a shop or maybe complete a contract. Adding crafting into the game radically changes your options. You can still mine, refine, and sell your resources, but now you have the option to make valuable and unique items. Weapons, armor, even vehicles and ships. <laughs> right? And by valuable, I mean that the crafted gear that you create has the potential to be better than anything you can buy in a shop. Yeah. <laughs> but crafting just isn't in with shiny new gear. Think much bigger. Crafting enables you to build your own home among the stars. You choose to make a farm, a hunting lodge, an industrial complex, your own trading hub, a military outpost, even a sprawling town with your friends and org mates. <laughs> Got a lot here, but it's all optional. You can choose to focus on gathering resources and sell them to crafters that need them. You can skip gathering and refining and just focus on being the best crafter you can be. Or you can leave all that gathering and crafting nonsense to other people and just focus on trade and make some money. But that brings me to my last point. Player choice matters. When a player makes a choice, they assign value. Players' choices about crafting and base building will drive player trade. The community's choices will determine the value of the materials and the crafted goods you can all make. The game will still have its own shops and economy alongside players, but now you'll have more options about where you invest and how you prosper. Now, I'm giving you a nice overview of what we're working on here. And we have a lot more planned for the future. 
But now that you're familiar with the big picture, I want to in introduce some of my fellow developers to come up on stage. They've got exciting details to share with you about the specifics of our new crafting systems, important gameplay improvements, and most exciting, I think anyway, an update to base building. To start things off, please welcome Jacob Taylor to the stage. Thank you, Rick. And hello, CitizenCon. Hi, I'm Jacob, Senior Gameplay Programmer on Crafting. Rick has showed us how crafting will link into a lot of existing and new gameplay. But I think it's time we get into some of the details. I'm going to tell you about the new game mechanics we're introducing, starting with blueprints. Before you can craft anything, you'll need a blueprint. Blueprints provide the recipe to perform all kinds of crafting processes, including refining. You can acquire blueprints through various activities. Some you can buy, some you can find, and some can be unlocked or earned in other ways. You can also upgrade your blueprints through research. We'll go into more detail about what this means a bit later. So, Blueprints are the recipe, and Rick already told us the materials you gather and refine will be the ingredients. But there's a bit more to it than that. We have a new concept for materials, material quality. Quality is a property we're adding to all resources you can gather. That's an abstract measurement of how good it is at being whatever it is. You can think of this as the purity of a metal, or the ripeness of a fruit, or something along those lines. This quality will be carried forward from raw resources through the refining process to influence what that batch of materials is best used for in crafting. High quality is more desirable overall, but is more rare, and there are still important uses for low quality materials. More on that later. All raw materials you find in the verse will have a quality rating that's generated based on some rules, the same kind of rules you heard about from the Planet Tech team yesterday. You'll find the same material in many places, but with varying qualities, so you might want to explore to find the best. Some materials that are already rare will be even more valuable if you can find them with high quality. But what's quality for? It's for item stats. Alongside quality, we're introducing a new item stat system to the game. This will allow relevant properties of craftable items to be affected by the quality of materials used to craft them. For resources, just a single quality rating is sufficient to provide variation. But craftable items have such diverse purposes that we need a more detailed system to provide both progression and customization options. We aim to have meaningful item stats for all craftable items. But some examples would be the damage and fire rate of a gun, the wear resistance of a ship component, or even the satiation provided by eating a hot dog. So, as I said, the quality of materials will directly affect the item stats, such that higher quality results in better stats. Most items require multiple different materials to make, which may each influence different stats. And in many cases, you'll have a choice of materials to use, which lets you decide which stats to focus on to tailor your items to your playstyle. Here we see I'm making a gun with high-quality aluminium, giving me a nice bonus to integrity and weight. But someone sold me low-quality copper, so I don't get as much fire rate bonus as I could have. To go even further, 
researching your fabrication blueprints allows you to build higher tiers of an item with improved base stats. So a higher tier item will be better than a lower tier item that was made with materials of the same quality. Making high tier items requires more advanced materials, but is also how you access greater choice as to which stats to improve. This means that your high tier items can not only be better overall, but also more specialized in the areas that are important to you. Most items will have tiers one to three, with tier one being the most basic version of the item, and tier three being a highly advanced version made with appropriately impressive materials. But you can also craft vehicles. Yeah. And vehicles are so important that they will go up to tier five, providing a way for you to really invest in making your favorite vehicles excel. Of course, many of you have already bought your favorite vehicles, so you don't really need to make them from scratch, right? Or maybe you've pirated, salvaged, or otherwise commandeered a vehicle. <laughs> Not to worry. You can still benefit from crafting by using an upgrade blueprint to increase the tier of an existing vehicle, including including the usual stat improvements and customization. Upgrading a vehicle can save a lot of time over crafting it from scratch, so it's a convenient way for established vehicle owners to bring the benefits of item stats to their fleet. Let's take a look in game at the difference it makes to have high tier equipment made from high quality materials. See how the recoil is reduced on our high tier gun. The spooling is faster on a high-tier quantum drive. And a high-tier scraper beam is much more effective. So, that's an overview of crafting's key game mechanics. I'll now hand over to Torsten to walk you through the full crafting process. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you, Jacob. Hi, I'm Torsten, lead system designer of the CGP system design team. We now saw all elements of craft crafting looked at individually. Let's bring them in order how you, as the player, will experience the crafting profession. You will start with acquiring the correct blueprints as the first step in the crafting process. As Jacob already mentioned, blueprints can be acquired in multiple ways. Let me give you some examples here. You can purchase commonly available blueprints earn them from reputation and mission rewards, or even find them in loot crates. All content in our game could reward you with a blueprint. Some blueprints will be challenging to find, so players working together may find them easier to acquire. While you may find a blueprint on a data pad or other portable device, the blueprint itself is not a physical item. You don't collect them in a box or stack them on a bookshelf. Blueprints are digital. Once you claim one, it is permanently added to your personal library. This library... Yeah. This library is persistent to your character, and every blueprint you claim is yours forever. They cannot be stolen or traded once claimed. But it does not just end with acquiring blueprints. Those tiers of quality that Jacob mentioned are unlocked through blueprint research. Research requires a research data bank which can upgrade your blueprints. 
upgrading here means that you unlock a blueprint that allows you to create a better, higher tier version of the same item using more advanced materials. Note, you will still have access to the lower tier versions if you want to craft the cheaper version. In order to upgrade a blueprint, you may need to perform certain actions. In this example, we need to craft 100 volt pistols and have one with a higher fire rate. Other examples would be collect resources, complete missions, or acquire research data from the Science Guild. Research is time intensive in addition to the action requirements. It will take time for the research data bank to process your research data and unlock the upgrade. You are also limited in how many research projects you can pursue at once. Now that you have your blueprint and you decided what to craft, you also know what resources to look for. Every blueprint you find will have unique requirements in their resource needs. It will not just be you need iron. We want to make use of the professions we have to meaningfully involve them in the crafting process. Especially for the more advanced blueprints, you can expect that it will require materials for multiple sources. And, as already mentioned by Jacob, pay attention to the quality. If you want to have the perfect item, you also need the best quality. Here, the best way to find the best resources is to get out and explore the worst. If you want to find the best hidden materials, then you get yourself a top quality radar. Once you've collected the raw materials, the next step is refining them. Refining, like crafting, requires blueprints. Refining blueprints take primary, secondary, and catalyst materials and produce refined materials. The rule is very simple. The quality of the primary raw material defines the quality of the refined material. The secondary material you put in has an impact on the quantity and the time the refining process will take. An optional catalyst can speed up the process further. Let me give you a simple example. If you want high quality steel, you need to put in the best iron you have in the primary slot. You, can put an, you can put any quality coal in the secondary slot without affecting the quality of the steel. But the quality of the coal will influence how much of it you need to produce steel. As an example, if you put in low quality coal, you might require 4 SCU of coal versus high quality coal that only requires 2 SCU. This is one of the important use cases for low quality materials that Jacob mentioned. You can use refining stations in the world as they will be converted to this new process. You can build your own refineries for yourself, you can get your org to help you out, or you can simply trade for the materials that you need on the open market. Now we are reaching the final step. You've got the blueprints, you've gathered resources and refined materials. Now you can create the item you want. And this item can be anything. You will be able to craft anything from FPS equipment to vehicle components, even entire vehicles and buildings. You just need access to the relevant crafting machine. <laughs> Talking about crafting machines. We will have a ride before you that differ in what process they can support like a refinery or a dedicated vehicle crafting machine. We will also find them in various places. There will be communal ones like the station refineries you already know, player-owned that can be in your personal hangar, a vehicle or your base. As all that we have talked about just now, these crafting machines also come in tiers. Here, the tiers will affect how well those machines do their job. You will not only progress in the products you produce, but also in the infrastructure to produce your wares. Just to give you an idea what you will encounter, here are some examples of the crafting machines. There's, there is the nutrition fabricator, the chemical fabricator, an item fabricator, and even fabricators of a much larger scale we will talk about later.
talking about scale. I would like to talk about the future of crafting and the scale it will have in the game that you all know and how it will change the game moving forward. As you all know, we, had a, we have a lot of items in the game and they all require their own unique blueprints. That means our aim is to have more than 1,000 blueprints that include the creation and the refining blueprints. And each of those can be researched to unlock tier upgrades up to tier 3 or tier 5. That's a lot of blueprints. And it will surely take a lot of time to unlock everything. So I, personally, recommend that you, as the crafter you are, focus on a specific field first and extend your knowledge from there. Collaborate and coordinate with your friends and fellow players. If you are part of a group, we invite you to share responsibilities with your org mates. Maybe you will be the FPS crafter while your friend is a ship crafter, but they know a ship component crafter specialist. There's a lot of content, and it will continue to grow over time. You are free to be a generalist crafter, a specialist, or something in between. Pick the blueprints you care about and be the best. Have an exotic shield generator that no one else has the blueprint for but you. Help others and earn credits while doing so. It is a real profession in the game that will benefit from your dedication and attention. As you can tell, crafting will have a huge impact on everything in the game. Even if you do not want to get actively involved, at some point you will stumble over a weapon that got crafted by someone else and you will be using it. People will start selling their crafting goods or the refined materials or even the raw materials for the sole purpose of fulfilling the demand created by crafting. Players like you can become well-known specialists that are sought out to get certain things crafted from. With the ever-expanding game we all love, we will continuously expand our crafting to offer you long-term progression that involves the entirety of our game. And you might have guessed it already, but there's one more thing that crafting is the foundation of, and that is base building. I will now hand over to Luke. Enjoy the second part of this presentation. Thank you very much. Well done. Good morning, citizens. Who's excited to start talking about this next topic? Let's get into it. My name is Luke Gijsbertse. I'm the lead environment artist on base building structures. Now that we have an understanding of the fundamentals of crafting, thanks to Jacob and Thorsten, we can explore how crafting is the foundation of base building. Up until now, everything in the game we made for you. From here on, we will give you the tools to build your own stories, your own homes, and truly make the universe yours. Join me on a journey on building our own habitable home on Pyro. Keep in mind that the following footage is work in progress, including its UI, design, and visuals. And we're super excited to share this with you. We found a beautiful location by a lake. This is where we build ourselves a home. To do so, we need some resources and the construction graph card. The construction graph card allows us to survey the land, claim the land in a lawful system, and it allows us to build structures. As we've already found the location and don't need to claim land in lawless pyro, we can straight dive into building our base. 
Keep in mind, the following UI is a work in progress. A survey drone that deploys from the top of the cart gives us a controllable augmented view of the land. In the new structure mode, we'll pick a small basic structure and hit construct. For this demo, the construction will be instantaneous. But in the final product, this will take you quite some time. We've done it. We've built our first structure. Let's have a look on the inside. As we walk into the small basic structure, we see an empty interior that is dimly lit. It's up to us to define what we will use this space for. In our case, we will want to make it into a home. We can see that the lights are still off, and that is a problem, because no lights means no atmosphere, no breathable atmosphere. So it's not ideal to live in. So how do we solve this issue? We can improve this by providing the building with power. Let's see if we can build something that helps us out. But before we dive into more building, let's take a quick moment to enjoy the freedom that the survey drone provides us with and admire the aesthetics of our first structure. And I wonder what Declan was up doing there. Keep in mind that base building is still work in progress, but what you're seeing right now has been recorded directly in the client and works seamlessly between first person and the building mode. Okay, enough. Back to base building. In the list of new structures, we see a small fuel generator. That is something that could solve our problem, I think. Power providing structures need to be hooked up to other buildings inside construction ER mode, but we'll explain this later. The fuel generator, is one of several structures that provides power, each with their own benefit and drawbacks. Fuel power is quick and easy to build, but it requires a constant supply of fuel besides its regular maintenance. If a structure is not maintained, it will halt its activity. Players will need to maintain fuses to keep the, beta, uh, the building operational. The better crafted fuse, the longer it lasts. This is where the fuse goes on this building. Next up, we have a terminal that gives us access to the status of our building. And, more importantly, we get to activate it here. That should do it. Let's see if we got power in the building now. As you notice, some of the crates in the background have disappeared as their content has been consumed during the construction process of the buildings. And it looks like Declan is now hooking up the power to the, bil uh, the, power to the building. I wonder what he was up to earlier though. Wow. Declan has been busy decorating the place. As we can see, the lights are now properly working. We got atmosphere, and uh, we can start to use the item fabricator now that there is power. Always handy in case we need a fuse. Let's have a quick look at what we've done so far. We've decorated the place. We made it our own little home. We hooked it up with power. I would say, we have a place that we can live in. It might not be much, but I think it's just enough to call it a home. Thank you. <laughs> now that we have a rough understanding of how base building works, let's dive into some of the specifics of what we just saw. The construction graph card is one of four devices used for base building. The graph card is a mobile device that lets you construct a variety of small structures and has been designed specifically to fit into the smallest ships like the Drake Cutter. The graph card allows us to survey the land to find a good location, 
to claim the land with credits when we're all in a lawful system like Stanton, and most importantly, it lets us build structures. To use the graph card, we will first need to deploy it. Once deployed, we see two small construction zones inside the card, and the interactive screen gets revealed to us. From here, we can deploy the survey drone from the extended top part of the card. This survey drone gives us a bird eye view of the surrounding area using augmented reality mode, ER mode for short. Let's have a look at some UI concepts of how this augmented reality mode will look like. Here's a concept of construction ER. From here, we get a more detailed view of the land. Where can and can't I settle? For an example, inside a nature reserve, construction will be prohibited. A nearby are nearby areas flat enough to place my structures on? Are there any underground extraction deposits nearby? And if so, what are their quality and quantity? Let's say we found a good place to start building our base. Then next up, we need to find a good place for our first structure. On the left-hand side, we can see that we're now in structure creation mode. Underneath that, there is a list of structures that we can build. Once you have chosen a structure, you'll drag it onto the terrain shown, uh, that will be shown then as a physicalized hologram. From here, you can move and rotate to find the perfect position for your structure. Now that we have chosen a position for our structure, we will need to supply it with crafting materials. Just like the crafting interface that we saw earlier, this is where you choose the materials, and the better materials you choose will result in a better structure. Once you're ready, we'll hit the craft button on the right bottom to send the construction drones printing to the buildings. The automated construction drones will take off from the construction graph card and fly to nearby resources to fill their internal storage and then fly over to the construction site to print the building until their internal storage has been depleted. The construction drone then repeats the loop by filling its internal storage again by nearby resources. Printing buildings will take some time. Keep the construction supplied so that you don't delay the process any further. Let's say our building did just finish printing, then what? Then we need, power, uh, we need to power the building. All structures will have a unpowered and a powered state that we can manage inside the resource manager. To provide st uh, structures with power, we can easily link generators to structures that need power in the resource management menu within construction ER. We can also link multiple buildings together. And we can assess the power consumption and shortage of, uh, inside this resource management screen. Keep in mind that operational structures, like power generators, require maintenance of their fuses and sometimes need to be supply uh, and sometimes need supplies coming in and going out to be managed. Now that we have a structure and power, what can we do next? Then we can actually upgrade our structure. Structures can be upgraded from tier one till tier three. The better material you provide the better the improvement will be, just like Jacob and Thorsten explained in the crafting presentation. Tier upgrades can, for example, improve the structural integrity of the building or make its resource consumption more efficient. To really make your base feel like home, you will want to decorate your base with a wide variety of furniture pieces that can be bought, crafted, and found in the universe. It's up to you to define what you want this space to be. Do you want to decorate it as a hospital? Do you want to make it into a workshop? Do you want to make it into a luxurious bedroom? It's up to you. Furniture can easily be placed and moved using decorative ER mode as a hologram. This is so your furniture can easily fit through doors. This feature is accessible through nearby construction devices, allowing you to place down furniture pieces or even crafting machines 
that otherwise wouldn't fit through the door. And you get to place them directly from your local inventory. The less trusted among you, or anyone settling in Pyro for that matter, may want to Mac lock their furniture into place so that only you and your friends get to re uh, rearrange your decorations. And best of all, Decorative ER is not exclusive to base building and can also be used for personal hangers and ships. <laughs> to recap, what are the essentials for any base? One, come prepared, bring the right resources and a construction device with you. Two, use the resource manager, power generators, to make your, uh, your base habitable and functional, and maintain your base with resources and by replacing out worn fuses. And three, personalize your base, personal hangar and ship with decorative ER. And there we have it, our home in Pyro. Now that we have an understanding of the basics of base building, we'll explore how you can go uh, and make more than just a home. But before I hand you over to Declan, the designer behind base building, I'd like to say a quick thank you for those who made this presentation possible. So a quick thank you to Eddie, uh, Brandon, Jack, Dan, Mark, Xiao, Stefan C, Dom, Stefan T, Carl, Joel, and Rob for your efforts and dedication. <laughs> now give me a warm welcome for Declan. All right, thank you, Luke. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Deck. I am the system designer behind crafting and base building, and we've just seen a nice little base, right? That's good for cabin in the woods. Maybe you want to place it down to next to the big redwoods, go and explore, or a place to stash some loot you perhaps shouldn't have. But do you want to see a big base? Good, because we're going to industrialize. <laughs> so we're going to set ourselves a goal before we do a video, and we're going to create a base that's capable of crafting something that's bigger than the item fabricator can handle. It's been a bit of a spoiler already as to what it's going to be. So to kick us off, called in the help of a friend who has a specialized, not yet revealed base building vehicle, and he's built us this. It is the construction hub. This has four automated drones compared to the grav carts too. They can build small, medium, and large buildings. So far, we've only seen small. Automated drones are capable of building one structure each simultaneously, so four is quite a big advantage. We'll pop into our construction AR, and we'll get down a generator. We'll connect some buildings together, just so we have a place to call home before we begin. All right, there we go. So we've settled on one of the brand new underground resource deposits, and we're about to exploit it using this. It is our extractors. This particular one is a large solid extractor. We'll also have liquid and gas, depending on which type of deposit that you've settled on. We have our output grid here, where we're getting all the brand new resources up out the ground. And it is important to note that once these things are set up, it's not a case of just free resources forever. On key structures like this, there are fuses which will occasionally be replaced, as well as environmental wear, which can be fixed using crafting materials.
we want to turn those raw resources into the more valuable refined materials we saw the process talked about earlier with Thorsten. Of course, we want this. It is our refinery. Once again, there are multiple types here. This one is the large solid matter refinery. We have liquid and gas again, as well as biological, depending on the type of materials that you're using and want to produce. Refinery has input and output grids for input, as you might expect. It's for the resources which you're going to consume, and then the output is for the resulting refined goods. This is a terminal where you'd select which blueprint you want to use, and therefore which type of refining method you want. A lot of crates here with our extractor and our refinery, so we're going to put down our elevator storage. Base is really starting to build up now, but it's worth me mentioning again here that whilst we're putting like, these buildings down instantly in this video, large structures like this, they will take some time with the automated construction drones, but the smaller scale base we saw in the previous video, that can be done in a single play session. We'll just keep on putting down more extractors because we want as much as that valuable resource out of the ground as quick as possible. And with base building, we're introducing the concept of a freight elevator network. What this will allow you to do is it will allow you to link multiple freight elevators together and in turn, they will share the same storage. So as we're doing here, we'll deposit an item on freight elevator A. and then we're retrieving it on freight elevator B. There is a distance limit, but you can daisy chain the elevators together to extend that. And it has to all be contained within the same base. Now, as we expand, we might want to invite more people to join us. This is easy to do. There will be permissions that we can set up granting people access to our base, and they can even build their own structures if they wish. We can also give them access to existing structures, which is how you can form your org storage using those freight elevators. We always want a safe place to store our ships, so the trusty hangar will do. You see it has this large, we call it a foundation tile, it's quite special and it can actually deform the terrain around it, making it easy to place such a huge structure like this. You can also place other buildings on it, so it's easy for making large, sprawling bases. However, there is one final piece of the puzzle that we need to achieve our goal, and it is this, our very own fabrication hangar. Does anyone want to guess what we're going to build in a fabrication hangar? An Idris, maybe not, maybe not an Idris, if I'm honest. <laughs> we'll have a drive around, we'll go to the entrance and we'll see what's in store for us. like whatever it is, it's just about finished crafting. Of course, we were going to build ourselves a ship. So, 
quick recaps of the gains from industrializing. We've tapped into the brand new resources and we've made use of them by turning into the more valuable refined materials. We've introduced freight elevator networks, which are great for logistics and hauling. And then we've created our fabrication hangar, which has allowed us to craft big valuable items such as ships. Now, ships are valuable because you can, of course, you can fly them and play content with them. But because they are a crafted item, they can also be sold to other players. So, with base building, you're going to be able to set up your own shops, and there's two main ways you can do this. The first is using a dedicated trading terminal. You can link these to your freight elevators, and in turn, any items within can be listed for sale at a price you deem reasonable. This includes resources, refined materials, and so on. Using the terminal, visiting players can browse what's on offer, purchase, and then collect from that same freight elevator. The second method is to set up a physical shop in the world. By using the decorator AR we saw earlier with Luke, you can maglock items and then list them for sale. Once again, browsing players, they can see the price of the maglocked item, purchase it, which then removes the maglock. Of course, the nice thing with physical shops is you can genuinely make it feel like a store. You can put items on shelving. You can even go as far as to make your own ship showroom. You can advertise your wares on a Moby Glass for UEC. However, it is important to note that the point of purchase will always occur at the base itself. Now that we know how to set up shop, I just want to take a moment to talk about why it's so impactful for crafting and base building the game as a whole. Understandably, throughout this presentation, we've been telling you why you want to craft all these things or why you want to build this big base. But maybe you don't have the time to build a big base and maintain it. Maybe you want to spend your time doing the missions, you want to do your beacons, that's how you want to make your credits instead. Shops mean that you can benefit from the players who do want to spend the time making those bases or crafting on those specialist items, and then you can purchase them from them which is very important because crafted items using high quality materials will be the most powerful in the game. On the flip side, if you do specialize, maybe you end up cornering the markets for a particular item or resource and your shop will then turn into a hotspot of activity, making you loads of credits. Some of you will become infamous because of it. But bear in mind, a successful shop also depends on location. Do you want your customers on edge in pyro, which tends to have the higher quality materials? Or do you want to spend time hauling them all the way over to safer systems where your customers can be more at peace? We've talked about selling items, let's sell the look of your base. We have foundation tiles, which can help you divide up the foundation, foundation decals, sorry, which help you divide up the foundation tile. You can place them freely wherever you want, and they just help you mark up areas like, I want to use this place for cargo, I want this for housing, vehicles, and so on. You'll be able to earn paint in-game and apply them to buildings. as well as add your own custom text. So if you're part of an org, the blue, base, the blue buildings that have your name are definitely yours. We have some forms of base building which are either still in the design phase or early white box, but we want to share some details. First up, we have farming and ranching. Farming, it comes in two general types. We have our low-tech farming and then high-tech. Low-tech consists of you acquiring the seeds, planting them in the appropriate environment. If you remember back to yesterday, the Brave New Worlds, we had soil types and such now. That will play a part. As well as supplying them with nutrients and then just harvesting them when they're grown. High-tech, it's a bit more involved because you've got to make the hydroponic buildings we see here. But in return, you'll be able to grow exclusive strains of plants. Ranching will allow you to keep herds of animals. You'll have to provide them with feed, water, and shelter, but in return, they will provide you with produce. Not every animal can be ranched. I don't really see a sandworm ranch anytime soon, but the quasi-grazer will, of course, will. Not yet. Maybe. No. <laughs> We have a few more additional archetypes. We have landing pads, garages, roads, fencing, as well as new variants of structures which we've seen today. For instance, the power generator, there'll be solar power, fusion, geothermal. 
as well as the XL structure class. So if you remember, everything we've seen today, the biggest we've seen today, rather, is large. XL is larger than large. And then you have your defense. So, in lawful areas, you have varying levels of security provided for you. With max security, you are protected by planetary shield tech. However, in lawless, pyro and the likes, you'll have to provide your own defenses. These come in the form of perimeter walls, shielding, which prevents aerial bombardments, and then a range of automated turrets, such as PDT to shoot down missiles, anti-air, anti-vehicle, and anti-personnel. To round up, whilst we spent this entire time talking about how you can expand a single base, you can, of course, have multiple. These can be across a single planet, moons across multiple systems. There are advantages and disadvantages of locations and base types. For example, in lawful areas, you'll need to buy your land for UEC, pay a tax to be able to build, and then you'll gain protection in return. In lawless, no cost. High chance of better quality materials, but no security to fall back on. A small cabin in the woods can be great to set up in a single play session with short build times. However, the large base we just saw will take days, weeks, or even months, depending on how big you want to go. You might want to embark on this endeavor as a team or an org. You can set up a base as an org and own it as the org. For this, there will be permissions available, and you can assign roles and tasks. Ultimately, base building can be your main gameplay loop or a supplementary one, depending on what it is that you value. On that final note, I would like to say thank you on behalf of the crafting and base building teams. We've been very excited to share with you some of the work so far and the vision we have for these systems. But before we go, we have uh, one final video. So, today we're going to be talking about the vehicles to build your universe. And for those of you that watched the previous presentation, which is awesome about base building and crafting, you should be familiar with the <laughs> construction grav cart. <laughs> and you've seen how this works. You might be wondering, well, if I've got this, why do I need some vehicles to do things? I know there's going to be some of you that will be perfectly prepared to go push this thing hundreds of kilometers out of the garages at New Babbage. But realistically, you're going to need a ship to put it in. It can't carry supplies by itself, so you're going to need to put supplies in the ship, move them. And it has small drones. And that's the key aspect there. It has two small drones on board. Uh, and drones will have sizes. OK, so yeah, basically everything you're going to be building in Star Citizen has its, its size class. You know, a lot of you are familiar with how we class our ships and, and a lot of other things in our game. So we ranges from you know, small all the way up to large and extra large. And our drones kind of fall into those classes as well. But you know, what does it really mean, the difference between you know, what's a small drone, what's a large drone, what's a larger than large and extra large, and so on? And basically, 
you know, a, a medium drone, for example, can build any structure up to a medium size. So it can build small mediums, and it will be able to build small structures faster than what a small drone would. So the size makes a difference, depending on how big you want to go. But the drones also scale in, um, they scale in numbers, in that you know, one drone can only make one structure at a time. So the grab cart's got two drones on it, so I'll be able to create two small structures. But a medium, or you know, a, if you've got a vehicle that carries multiple drones, you can craft a lot more structures, a lot bigger sizes, and that's kind of really the key to kind of like the upgrade path through the kind of drone sizes. So we've had a look at the, the small. So what what what's next? What do you want to build? A medium. So I know some of you have already seen it, but you know this is the CSV from Argo. So launching today is the very first ground vehicle from Argo, the construction support vehicle, CSV. Uh, so this specialized chassis is developed to take on all the conditions on all our planets. It's a little rugged beast that really does just go everywhere. Uh, and if you're constructing a new settlement, there's two things you need. You need drones to build it. You need supplies to supply the drones to build it. And that's why the CSV comes in two variants. So we have the CSV FM, which stands for fabrication module. So this has two medium drones on board, uh, and we built it to fit in as many vehicles as we could practically get it to fit in. So it fits in vehicles from a cutlass black upwards. It's approximately, and everyone always asks me what ship fits in what, and I lose track of it all the time, uh, it's about the size of a tumbrel cyclone. So if you can put a cyclone in a vehicle, you could put one of these in it. Um, obviously, two medium drones on board, and then it has an internal storage tank for resources. So it has a very small uh, version of a freight elevator built into the back of it. So you feed it one SCU crates. It absorbs them into the holding tank on board, and then the drones will come back to the vehicle to refill. And it also has a size zero serial generator on board for a bit of added protection. What happens when you run out of resources? This is where the CSV SM for supply model comes in. So the second CSV-based vehicle in the game uh, and this has a traditional four SEU cargo grid on the back. So four one SEU boxes, two two SEU boxes, one four SEU box. Depending on what you buy, you can use this to bring it and move it around. So this is the perfect companion vehicle to the CSV FM. Said that. Shield generator as well. Moves about 28 meters a second. I cannot, my brain is fried. I can't remember what that is in miles per hour or kilometers per hour. And it is available right now to drive in SC Alpha 324.2. Uh, available at playersc.csv. So now, let's take a little closer look at the vehicle, and Ben's going to go through it. OK, so what we're seeing here is the in-game version of the CSV. It's complete with its four SCU of cargo up on the rear. And I think the CSV kind of really builds on what Argo is known for as a manufacturer. It's got those kind of like really you know, kind of hard industrial looks, and I think it helps it kind of feel at home on any build site. All of its components are you know, easily accessible, and I think the exterior is like real dominating factory. So it's kind of large all-terrain wheels, and then that's kind of backed up by you know just simple, smooth, sleek lines. We've got the front loading cab that puts all the controls kind of right in the kind of you know where the player needs them. And I think that's one of the keys to the ship as a whole, or the vehicle as a whole, sorry, is it's you know simple, it's purposeful, it's functional. And I think that just kind of you know just helps it to kind of feel part of that Argo family. But, but what if you want to go bigger? Bigger? Bigger. OK. So, introducing the Star Lancer family. So, yeah, the Star Lancer is basically a whole new family of vehicles um, you know, from, from MISC, and, and these are covering a, a range of different roles. Today, we're going to be talking about the first three, which are the build, 
which kind of makes sense. And that basically is for all your large structural construction needs. We have the TAC, which is going to be for people that want a little bit more um, defensive or offensive excursions in our universe. And then we have the MAX, which is a dedicated hauler, but it can still pack a bit of a punch. So we're going to take a bit of a closer look at all of them today. We're going to start off with the build. So this is the stance of build from the outside. Uh, the key thing to take away here <laughs> is you'll see it has the drone bays on each side, and then it has the drone resupply arms for allowing the drones to come back and resupply. Inside that room, you have the drone control center. So you have a single station inside, and this is where you control all your drones from, much like Luke showed you in the uh, previous presentation. So there are two large drones held on each side of the room, so four large drones in total. And then there are two filler stations right at the front here, and these each hold 16 SEU of capacity, which can then go and load the internal resource tank to feed the drones. Drones that will then be deployed out of their little secret garages, uh, and they go off and do what you've asked them to do. When they need to resupply, they will come back, sit on these arms, suck up their resources that they need, carry on their day. And it's the really important thing here is that all these base building vehicles have enough storage on board to supply your drones. Obviously, if you're going to build a million things on your base, you're going to run out. But we want you to be able to have these vehicles and have knowledge that you're not going to be doing endless cargo runs initially to build your foundation of your base. You'll be able to build your base and have storage on that eventually, but these all get you going in the short term. So let's have a quick go over the stats. It holds four large construction drones. It's 83 meters long, 52 meters wide, 15 tall. I uh, saw lots of rumors and chatters that people thought this was freelancer size. It is not. It is significantly larger than the Constellation and Corsair. It's almost 600i in size, so it is a, a big ship. Two S-4 guns for the pilots, 16 missiles, remote turrets, and then 128 SU of cargo capacity in the build specifically. But what if you don't want to build stuff? What if, like me, you just want to burn stuff and destroy stuff? So introducing the Starlance attack. So like I say, this, this is designed to be a bit, bit more aggression into the verse. So I think the first thing you're going to notice um, is the kind of the dual man size five turrets. Now these give much, much better kind of broadside coverage from any of the other variants. And then on top, we also have like a dedicated hangar that has been specifically designed to fit a Mirai Fury inside. And I'm sure we will see plenty of other ships try to be fitted inside. Um, <laughs> Success, yeah. Not. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. And uh, I think John's going to run you through the interior now. So, yeah, let's have a look over the TAC from uh, outside to in. So, this is the TAC in its default paint, so sort of military drab gray. Then, internally, uh, obviously, Ben talked about the size 5 turrets. Uh, then, we have some drop seats behind, and these are on a deployable ramp, so you can do some ground assault. They will drop out down. If you're doing a bit of ground assault, Chances are someone's probably going to get injured. So there is an onboard medical facility directly behind there with two tier three medical beds. Uh, up upstairs, obviously, there is the Fury hangar. Uh, behind that is engineering. And then forward of the hangar is the refactored habitation and mess hall area, which is specific to the TAC, just because there's so much other stuff crammed in there. We had to redo the upstairs of it, basically, to fit that in. And we'll go over the, the more normal layout shortly. OK, so yeah, to sum up, I think you know, the TAC's obviously going to bring a lot more firepower from the other variants. Um, its shield's been boosted up to uh, two, two size three shield generators. Um, it's got the med bay with the tier three med beds, uh, drop seats, it's got the hangar, and it's still able to carry up to 96 SCU of cargo. And you can secure yours today by going to play.se forward slash Starlance Attack.
finishing touches on that now. Um, so yeah, we're just getting it all done, all ready for its launch at IAE. Um, we will take a little bit of a closer look at it now. I think the Star Lancer kind of really fully encapsulates MISC's kind of ability to create beautiful ships. It's got this bulbous design that really helps to kind of convey its underlying, underlying structure and its underlying strength. I think when the engineers were trying to kind of put this together, um, they were thinking about what, what's, what's useful, what's great. And one of the things that we thought about was this deployable cargo grid that just brings the cargo down to the ground, makes it much easier for loading and unloading. And they also wanted to put the kind of the crew, you know, they wanted to put what was important for them. So they've added a lot of windows out so the crew can see out into the verse. And it's one of the things that we know people like is being able to have these kind of little windows out into space. And then above the kind of main habitation area, we've got these big skylights, and they just allow kind of like more natural light to cast down into the, the cruise area. For a bit more protection, you've got uh, eight size three missiles at front, and then a further eight on top. And these are backed up by uh, a set of size four remote turrets, both front and rear, that give good topside coverage. And then finally, when we get to the front, you'll see we have a further set of size four gimbaled weapons. And again, these just kind of help to fill in those blind spots. I think as a whole, I think you know, the engineers or MIS have done an exceptional job in creating a vehicle that kind of fully encapsulates um, the functionality needed while still ensuring that the crew's kind of well-being and livelihood is protected. It's all in a package that kind of really dominates the sky, and I think it really shows off Mist's ability to deliver kind of quite beautiful ships. Right, so don't worry, this is not an Origin 404 moment happening here. So let's have a look inside the Star Lancer Max now. So, love it or hate it, we love it. The MISC traditional letterbox view is back. Uh, at the front of the ship, you have the pilot co-pilot seat with two support stations at the rear. These are the ones that control the remote turrets by default. Then behind that, we have the escape pod room. Four escape pods, four crew. And then behind that, we have the traversal. It's sort of a traversal room. It has a lift, goes between the two floors of the ship and goes to the exterior of the ship and then a ladder for emergency backup. Behind that is the mess hall area, so nice shared communal space for you to relax with your crew. And then we move into the four individual crew rooms, each with uh, double beds, so very luxurious for a spaceship, en suites for all. And at the rear of this section, we have a further two lifts. These are just internal to go between the two decks of the ship. Then at the rear, we have the main engineering. So there are some components dotted around throughout the rest of the ship, but the bulk of your components and the engineering terminal are here at the rear of the ship. So that's upstairs. Let's go downstairs a little bit. We have the main vehicle entrance and cargo entrance uh, for the rear section. Uh, this can be used as a garage, but it is also a cargo hold. Can fit vehicles up to a Ursa rover in size in here. And then on the max, we have, as you saw in the trailer, uh, the two, it's sort of one cargo lift that drops down, but it retains a walkway throughout the center of the ship. So regardless of whether your cargo is up, down, being loaded, you still have traversal front to back of the ship. Then we have the downstairs of the traversal room, which also features the airlock onto, onto the ship. And then lastly, we have the armory at the front of the ship. So if you're coming on board, leaving via EVA, leaving via that front entrance to the ground, you can stop off here, suit up, get your weapons, do the reverse coming back. And that is the Star Lancer Max. So we'll quickly recap the stats. 224 SU of cargo. Uh, 128 on that ventral drop platform, 96 in the rear cargo area. It has six extra VTOL thrusters uh, for all that extra mass that it's hauling. 
and it is available to pre-order now and will be flyable this IE uh, at play.se play science and max. And if you uh, pre-order now before IE, you will get this exclusive sapphire paint, which is in the Citizen col colors and looks super cool in my opinion. So, we have talked small drones, medium drones, large drones. What about bigger things? So, who can guess what that is? So, uh, I talked to you all quite some time ago about this in Germany. Uh, and this is obviously the original concept for the Pioneer. Now, some time has passed, and whilst the core concepts of base building have remained the same at a high level, how you physically build your bases has changed slightly. So, back then, you were building everything on board the ship here. You would fly your Pioneer, you'd, this is the area I want to build in, I'm going to build my base on board the ship, and I'm going to drop it down. Now, as you've seen, bases are a lot more expansive now. This doesn't work anymore. So we need to do a little bit of some reconcepting. OK, so one of the first things we really wanted to kind of solve was, was the arm. Um, you know, we know a lot more about how we're going to be constructing these structures now. And kind of the arm didn't really make a lot of sense anymore. All, all it really did was um, it made the space you need to land the ship almost twice as big as what it, it's kind of needed. And you know, we're not real spaceship engineers. We don't, we don't make real spaceships. Um, but what, what we do try and do a lot of the time is we try and take as much reference from kind of real life manufacturing as we possibly can. And I think that's really, um, it's really key to what I think Star Citizen is as, as a whole across like all the different departments in that you know, we're trying to make a, a believable universe. And if you think about the arm, and whilst I can't deny it's a cool idea, um, I think, really, from, from a, a, a manufacturing point of view, all it really does is it adds a lot of complication and a lot of manufacturing costs onto what is already a very advanced, very large, very costly ship to make. Um, so that was kind of like one of the, the kind of real first things we wanted to do. The second thing we wanted to look at was kind of um, have a little bit of a, a shift around of kind of like the egress points on the ship. Um, we, we, the cargo position has moved, so we needed to kind of update that. Um, we wanted to make sure that the, the landing pad made sense and had space to kind of come into the ship. And then we also needed a way of getting things out of the ship that we will be crafting. Um, on top of that, we had a few other goals. Um, like I say, it needs to support the, all the updated kind of building mechanics. It needs to support all our current metrics. And I don't mean just character metrics, I mean all metrics, because we're going to be cre creating a lot of things inside this ship. Uh, we wanted it to kind of become a, a true um, self-sustained mobile base. We wanted it to kind of you know, be, um, be kind of like the cornerstone of your crafting and construction, construction ventures. And to do that, we needed to add a few extra kind of onboard facilities. So you know, a med bay, um, like I say, the crafting area, the ability to refine and or extract and refine materials. So let's have a quick look over the updated interior of the Pioneer. So at the back of the ship, we have the classic bridge, looks out over the expanse of the ship. Uh, and then top and bottom of that in this image, we have the escape pod rooms. And then leading off those is the access to the manned turrets that remain. Then going downstairs, we have the cargo uh, area at the top. Doesn't look like a lot. That's 1,000 SEU of cargo now in that space. <laughs> Next to that is the fabrication uh, control room. Uh, this is where you'll be controlling, fabricating larger vehicles and ships, as well as smaller fabrication machines next door for. You don't want to use this to build a small FPS weapon. It's a bit overkill. So we have that on board as well. In the center of the ship, we have a small fabrication hangar with roof and ramp egress. So if you're building a small ship on board, so things like a Nomad, you can build on board here 
you'll be able to fly it out the roof of the fabrication hangar. And then we have the existing small landing pad that transitions from outside the ship to inside the ship. So cargo you can load via a new entrance that Ben's going to talk about in a second, but you can still retain the ability to land a ship on top of this ship, move it inside your ship, all those things. Uh, engineering at the rear, this is now capital components all the way around. It was a weird mix of size threes before. It's now just all capital everything. Then we have the habitation, uh, mess hall, medical area between the hangar and engineering. And then at the front, we have four extra large drones in the drone room. Um, but we don't just have some pictures like this to show you. Ben's going to go through this in a bit more detail now. OK, yeah, so we're going to have a little look at kind of like the concept and where it's at on the interior. We start out on the, you know, the interior bridge. It's very spacious, or command deck bridge, whatever you want to call it. It gives kind of really nice views out over the front of the ship. And up right up front, you've got all the uh, consoles required that you need to kind of control the ship, as well as the kind of additional remote turret access consoles. And then at the rear, we have the main kind of navigation components and some small um, engineering consoles. And kind of flanking either side, we've got these two corridors, and they lead out to uh, the man turrets that kind of sit above the bridge. And they also have all the escape pods needed um, for all the bridge crew. Like I say, we want this to kind of be a home away from home, so we have a very large, uh, comfortable habitation area. Each of the crew members, they get their own individual crew pod. And one of the nice things about this is these actually open up and they allow kind of each crew member to kind of decide like how much privacy they actually want. This is the crafting area. We've got the four kind of crafting machines. And these are right next to the, the cargo bay, the internal cargo bay. And as John says, this holds up to you know, 1,000 SEU of cargo, so it's pretty sizable. To make it a little bit easier, it's got its own dedicated cargo lift at the back that again, just kind of, just simplifies that kind of getting cargo in and out of the vehicle. Down at the front, we have the drone room. Now these will be four extra large drones, so they'll be able to craft our, you know, our largest structures in game. They exit the ship out through the roof, and they're all controlled by the construction console in this area. And finally, we're just going to take a, a quick look at the crafting area on the ship. So you can see here, we've got these blast shields down that kind of protect the crew in this area from what's going on in, inside. And then as these open up, we've just, we just finished making a storm. And as, you know, as we see, there's a ramp that leads out. So you can drive any ground vehicle straight out the front. You know, between all the landing gear, and you get this really nice kind of like sense of scale as you're driving underneath out the front of the ship. And we've also got the, the top exit for any flight vehicles. And then finally, we have the, the landing pads. And this just you know, allows us for any ships that land up on deck, we can just bring them down into the belly of the ship. So. That's the Pioneer. It's had quite the glow up over the years. Holds four extra large drones. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out what extra large drones can build, I highly recommend sticking around for the next presentation. Uh, it's about 20% bigger. I know the jokes, we always make ships bigger. But to fit all that in, it needed it. It can craft small ships and vehicles. And one thing we didn't show in that video is the landing gear actually have integrated ground resource extractors in. So when you find your plot, you land your ship, and you can start extracting the resources from it. <laughs> Capital components all round. And now it has 1,000 SU of cargo capacity. Uh, now the bad news. When base building comes out, this will not be there day one of it. But we are starting this in the next week or two. So it is in production very soon. So, to finish up, we'll do the classic one last thing. CitizenCon is usually about looking forwards, but we'll do some housekeeping and look at the now and a bit before. 
So, oh, sorry, this is Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you remember last year, we kind of, we, we teased these 10 vehicle silhouettes. Um, now, these are vehicles that we were, you know, planning on working on this year, and we've not quite delivered all of them yet this year. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we did come quite close. Um, so, so far we've delivered six. We've delivered the Pulse, the X1, uh, the Medvac, the Argo and PUV 1T, the RSI Zeus, and the rework on the Retaliator. Oh, but what about the rest? Sorry. So, all but one of these will be, will be released before the end of the year. So, the Legionnaire is the one that's going to miss out. And that's because we want to align it with hacking gameplay. Um, but the rest will be here before the, the end of the year. So, Crusader Intrepid, Mariah Guardian, and the Polaris. So. We have a few patches between where I am today standing on stage and the end of the year. But let's start with some things that you're going to see at IAE.
Okay. So on top of those, those ships we've, we've talked about, um, we also worked on a number of other ships this year. So we're just going to quickly go through them before we get on to what we're doing next. So we delivered the Sulen, the Storm, the Cutter Rambler, the F7A and F7C Mark IIs. So I always get tongue twisted with these. And the F7A Mark Is. They we also did the Santok EI, the Sabre Firebird, the Peregrine, and then most recently, the Argo Atlas. So, like last year, where we did a little tease, can't, can't just leave without teasing a little bit more, so <laughs> let's have a quick look at just some, emphasis on some, of the vehicles that we're working on in the next 12 months.